As the sun sets over the cityscape, the glimmering lights start to take over the darkness, painting a captivating picture of what seems like a peaceful night in Humbercourt, the city's architectural wonders, capturing the serene beauty of its winding streets and quaint houses. But as the night deepens, the tranquility is abruptly shattered. Flashing police lights punctuate the distance, casting an eerie glow over the city's cobblestone streets. This is where our story begins, in an ordinary city that hides an extraordinary mystery. The city of Humbercourt, now a crime scene, is about to reveal its darkest secret. In the peaceful hamlet of Humbercourt, France, a chilling crime occurred that remains an enigma to this day. In this picturesque French town, a vibrant life was brutally ended. Francoise Schaub, a woman born in 1976, was discovered dead in her residence on the 26th of February, 2005. The cause of her premature demise, strangulation, a terrifying conclusion to a life prematurely taken. The individual who unearthed this horrific scene was none other than her spouse, Ludovic Chabe. On returning home from work, he encountered his wife's lifeless corpse. His response, however, was not one of silent shock or sorrow, but a frenzy so frantic that it provoked suspicion. This hysteria, along with the fact that he was the first on the scene, positioned him firmly in the investigative spotlight. But the plot thickens. Francoise was not just a wife and mother. She was caught in the intricate snare of infidelity, involved in an illicit affair with a peer named Stephen Q. This revelation introduced another dimension to the dilemma, another potential accused, and a new motive. However, despite the affair, the evidence persistently indicated Ludovic. He became the prime suspect. He even admitted to unintentionally causing Francoise's death during a game. But subsequently, he retracted his confession due to coercion from investigators, a twist that paved the way for a riveting judiciary voyage. The primary accused, Ludovic Chobb, was gearing up to steer through the maze of the judiciary, a journey that would culminate in his exoneration. However, Francoise's death remains an unresolved mystery, the reverberations of her premature demise persisting in the peaceful hamlet of Humbercourt. And as the years passed, the query lingered. Who really brought about the end of Francois Chabe? Ludovic Chabe, a seasoned fireman, found himself consumed in an inferno of his own making. The tribunal was his fresh war zone. As the aftermath of Francois Chabe's poignant end unfolded, the tribunal drama ensued. Ludovic, her spouse, was in the defendant's box as the chief suspect. His vocation as a fireman, a symbol of protection, was ironically set against the chilling indictment of murder. The tribunal was humming with expectancy as the hearing set off in full swing. Central to the prosecution's argument was Ludovic's initial admission. He had professed to have inadvertently killed Francoise during a game, an admission he later withdrew. The defense contested that this retraction was due to the severe duress from investigators, a claim met with cynicism by the prosecution. The hearing was a labyrinth of unexpected revelations and surprising shifts. Ludovic's frantic response upon finding Francoise's body was considered suspect by the prosecution. Yet his defense argued that such a reaction was a natural response to such a gruesome scene. The hearing took a further twist with the disclosure of Francoise's clandestine affair, casting a murky cloud over the entire proceedings. Despite the defense's efforts, the evidence stacked against Ludovic was incriminating. The climax of the hearing saw Ludovic condemned to a 12-year term in prison. A shocked hush fell over the tribunal as the gavel crashed down, signaling the close to this chapter of the saga. But this was far from the conclusion of Ludovic Chobb's tribulation. The wheels of lawfulness were still in motion. In 2015, the situation took a theatrical twist. Ludovic Chabe was granted a plea, and his verdict was about to be examined once more. Here, the gears of justice began to rotate again, meticulously dissecting the proof that once seemed so condemning. The plea process was a judicial nightmare, a convoluted journey of arguments, counter-arguments, and a reassessment of the facts. Ludovic's advocates spotlighted the lack of tangible proof linking him to the offense crime. They emphasized the lack of DNA, the lack of a clear incentive, and the doubtful conditions of his initial disclosure. In the original trial, Ludovic's panicked reaction upon discovering Francoise's body had framed him as the prime suspect. But now his lawyers argued that his reaction was merely that of a shocked and mourning husband. His disclosure, they claimed, was not an acceptance of guilt, but a frantic response to intense pressure from the investigators. As the events unfolded, uncertainties began to infiltrate the courtroom. Was Ludovic really the perpetrator, 
or just a man ensnared in the desperate pursuit of justice. Then came the verdict. The magistrates, moved by the lack of conclusive proof, decided to absolve Ludovic. The news struck like a bolt of lightning. Some celebrated it as a victory of justice, while others perceived it as a travesty. The decision was contentious to say the least. After all, if Ludovic didn't kill Francoise, who did? The dark cloud of distrust was lifted from Ludovic Chabe, yet the specter of the unsolved murder still hovered over Umbercourt. With Ludovic Scheib absolved, the inquiry remained. Who assassinated Francois Scheib? The after-effects of the absolution created ripples throughout the city. The verdict had astonished many, leaving behind a sour taste and a persistent sense of disquiet. The man who had been the focal suspect now sauntered freely, while the authentic offender remained elusive. The society's psyche was a spectrum of emotions. Some found solace for Ludovic, a man they believed had been falsely incriminated. Others clung on to their misgivings, contemplating if equity had been achieved or if it had been grievously misdirected. The tension was palpable, the suspicions concrete, and the inquiries, oh, the inquiries were ceaseless. And what of Francois Chubb? Who was accountable for the premature termination of this woman's life? The absence of fresh evidence in the case only escalated the mounting vexation. The detectives, once assertive in their pursuit of justice, now realized they were back at the starting point. The assassination of Francoise Schaub had morphed from a case to be deciphered into a lasting puzzle that haunted the corridors of Humber Court. And the most daunting concept of them all, the true killer still roamed the streets of the city. Who possessed the motive, the callous audacity to extinguish a life in its zenith? Theories proliferated, murmurs disseminated, yet the verity remained evasive, concealed within the obscurity of conjecture and mistrust. But perhaps that's the most unnerving aspect of this narrative. The verity, it appears, is a capricious creature, perpetually evasive and often peculiar than the most bizarre fantasy. And so, as we plunge into the abyss of this unresolved crime, we are left wrestling with more inquiries than solutions. The murder of Francois Chabe persists as a chilling memento that occasionally the truth is more peculiar and far more evasive than fantasy. In conclusion, the tale of Francois Chabe's murder is not merely about a transgression. It's a riddle of fairness and the unyielding pursuit of truth. The case unfurled with a shocking revelation in Umbercourt, spiraling into a courtroom drama that held France spellbound and left more uncertainties than solutions. We've witnessed a husband accused, convicted, then exonerated, his confession renounced, and the cloak of suspicion removed. Yet persisting uncertainties continue, casting lengthy darkness on the unresolved murder. It presents obstacles for us to question our assumptions, to see beyond the clear, and to wrestle with the uncomfortable reality that justice, occasionally, remains out of reach. Thus, we call upon you to ponder, to question, to consider the conundrum that is the murder of Francoise Schaub. What do you think transpired on that doomed day in February 2005? Who holds the key to the puzzle that remains unsolved? And so, the mystification persists, resounding through the quiet lanes of Humbercourt, waiting for the day when the light of truth finally pierces through the veil of darkness. In the core of 1984, a French noble abruptly vanished. Picture the astonishment, the bewilderment, the incredulity. This wasn't just any nobleman. This was Prince Marie Edouard de Xavier Ferdinand Auguste Gaspard de Lobkowicz, a name as magnificent as the man himself, a descendant of the revered Lobkowicz and Bourbon Parma clans. His ancestry connected back to notable European and New York families an ancestry that held significance, distinction, and an air of enigma. Edouard Xavier was not just a prince in designation. He was an armed forces personnel, a skilled paratrooper, and a reserve lieutenant in the French army. His life was devoted not just to the privileges of his birthright, but to the service of his nation. His obligations spread beyond national boundaries as he was a member of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, a group with a mission to aid the underprivileged, a testament to his persona. But on April 2, 1984, this man of honor, this prince of lineage, this servant of the masses, vanished. In the blink of an eye, he was gone. The reactions were prompt, a tempest of anxiety and conjecture. His kin, his companions, and the populace all were plunged into an ocean of queries. Where could he be? What could have transpired? Was he in jeopardy? The conjecture was widespread, propelled further by the prince's high-profile associations. In the midst of the turmoil, the initial reactions were of optimism. 
Optimism that the prince would be located safe and sound. Optimism that this nightmare would soon end. But as the days turned into weeks, that optimism started to wane. The prince remained absent, and a feeling of dread began to permeate. On April 27th, a chilling unearthing jolted the city of Paris. The Seine River, typically a vista of beauty and tranquility, became the backdrop for a scenario ripped from the pages of a crime novel. Floating in its shadowy waters was the lifeless form of Prince Edouard Xavier de Lobkowicz. This startling find was profound, the tragedy now tangible. Prince Edouard, an offspring of the Lobkowicz and Bourbon Parma lineages, was no run-of-the-mill citizen. A trained soldier, he was a man of varied skills and survival techniques. His vanishing earlier that month had already sent reverberations across the social scene, but the revelation of his body metamorphosed those vibrations into waves of disbelief and sorrow. His body exhibited the unmistakable symbols of a violent termination. Gunshot wounds riddled his body, a grim testament to the savagery of his final moments. The injuries were not arbitrary, they were intentional. He was shot with a hunting rifle aimed at his throat and left shoulder blade, then dropped into the river with a weighted belt to hold his corpse underwater. This was not an accident, this was an execution of cold-blooded murder. The news struck his family like a freight train. The Harvard-educated financier's firstborn, a prince, a soldier, was no more. His parents, sister, two brothers, and maternal grandmother were left to grieve, their anguish magnified by the gruesome details of his demise. As the news disseminated beyond his immediate circles, the response from the public sphere was one of shock and fascination. A prince slain in the heart of Paris. The city of love had suddenly turned into the city of fear. The community clamored for elucidation, and the French police faced a formidable task. Soon an inquiry was initiated, a quest for truth, a pursuit of justice ensued. Detectives meticulously scrutinized the evidence, assembling the last moments of the prince's existence. Every lead was pursued, every possibility examined, but the answers remained evasive, the motive obscure. Hypotheses and conjecture swirled, fanned by the prince's family ties and his high-profile existence. One theory that emerged was the possibility that the culprit was connected to his mother's ties with the Lebanese Christian group. However, nothing concrete ever came to surface. A life had been extinguished, and the chase for his executioner was in progress. The gruesome revelation was merely the onset of a mystery that would captivate the world. This was not merely a crime, it was a saga of power, privilege, and a prince's premature demise. Confronted with this heinous crime, the French police had their task mapped out for them. Starting a probe into the demise of an aristocrat is no trivial endeavor, especially when the victim is Prince Edouard Xavier de Lobkowicz. A man with a lineage as complicated as the case itself, his roots were intertwined with both the Lobkowicz and Bourbon Parma families. The possibilities were as extensive as the scene itself where his body was located. The investigation squad faced the challenge fearlessly, hunting for any potential clues. They explored every facet of the prince's life, from his military tenure as a trained paratrooper and membership in the sovereign military order of Malta to his family's elaborate European and New York ties. However, the more they probed, the more elusive the realities became. Could it be someone entwined in his father's arms-dealing associations? The strain was escalating. Each passing day was a ticking clock, the hands of time eroding the probability of cracking the case. The media, the populace, the family, all demanded answers. Yet the solutions were like specters in the night, perceptible, yet elusive. As the detectives maneuvered the labyrinth of the prince's existence, guesswork began to circulate. Rumors of his family's association started to resonate in the background of the investigation. Could it be a family squabble, a political strategy, or an arbitrary act of violence? The absence of a clear motive only amplified the puzzle. The prince's life was a riddle, and every fragment appeared to lead to another problem. His Harvard education, his position as a financier's eldest son, his military career, all these elements added layers to the case, each layer obscuring the line between reality and guesswork. As the days morphed into weeks and weeks into months, the investigation seemed to hit an impasse. The clues were evaporating, the hypotheses were unrestrained, and the reality seemed to be buried deep under the cloudy waters of the Seine. With each passing day, the case grew colder and the solutions seemed more distant. In the aftermath of this calamity, 
a family was left to piece together their shattered lives. The demise of Prince Edward Xavier de Lobkowicz, a promising young man of illustrious lineage, reverberated throughout his family and country. His parents, siblings, and even his maternal grandmother were left wrestling with the brutal reality of his premature passing. The prince's untiming death had left a gap that was impossible to bridge. And it wasn't just the family that bore the brunt. The general populace, too, was jolted by the prince's downfall. The unresolved mystery encompassing his death provoked a storm of theories, rumors, and conjectures. Yet, despite tireless investigations by the French police, the case stayed unresolved, intensifying the enigma of the young prince's existence and demise. Prince Edward's heritage, however, survived beyond his death. Born into the Lobkowitz and Bourbon Parma families, he shouldered the burden of a wealthy history and heritage. His premature death did not wipe out his contributions as a military officer or the esteem he amassed as a member of renowned European and New York families. His memory persisted, a symbol of the potential he represented, the promise that was ruthlessly snuffed out. But the aftermath of the prince's death wasn't confined to lamenting his loss. It also ignited a pursuit for truth a yearning to untangle the mystery shrouding his death. His family, acquaintances, and even the general public longed for answers, hoping to find some semblance of resolution. The inquiry into his death might not have revealed a motive, but it indeed kept his memory burning brightly, establishing Prince Edward as an emblem of unsolved mysteries and squandered potential. In end, the existence of Prince Edward Xavier de Lobkowicz remains a narrative of mystery and loss, a riddle that time has yet to unravel. In the records of true crime, few cases are as baffling as the murder of Prince Edward Xavier de Lobkowicz. We've delved into a tale that is as haunting as it is mystifying, a saga that begins with the inexplicable disappearance of a French aristocrat, Prince Edward Xavier de Lobkowicz. This young man, an offspring of the noble Lobkowicz and Bourbon Parma families, vanished without a trace on a chilling day in April 1984. The tale then took a ghastly turn with the macabre discovery of the prince's lifeless body in the Seine River, a sight that would send shivers down the spine of even the most hardened investigator. The prince's body bore the hallmarks of a brutal end, with gunshot wounds that told a story of brutality and cold-blooded murder. As our tale unfolded, we delved into the maze-like investigation that followed, a probe that, despite its best efforts, failed to illuminate the shadowy recesses of this murder. The lack of leads, the absence of a clear motive, and the seemingly random nature of the crime, all these elements combine to create a puzzle that remains unresolved to this day. The aftershocks of the prince's untimely demise reverberated far beyond the crime scene, leaving a lasting impact on his family and the public. His death, a grim reminder of the fragility of life, became a symbol of the enduring mysteries that lurk in the shadows of our world. And so, we bid adieu to this tale of aristocracy, mystery, and cold-blooded murder. So friends, keep your wits about you and remember, truth is always stranger than fiction. Let's take a trip back in time to the City of Love, 2013, an atrocity so chilling it still sends tremors through the heart of Paris. The metropolis's usual hum of life is brutally interrupted by an act of violence that leaves three ladies lifeless. These are not ordinary women. They are Leila Salemez, Sakin Kansiz, and Fidan Dogan. Leila Salemez, also known as Ronahi, held a significant position within the PKK, a Kurdish political and military organization engaged in an enduring conflict with the Turkish state. A warrant for her arrest had been issued in Turkey, a nation that labeled her a member of a terrorist organization. Facing such allegations, Salemez took refuge in Germany during the 1990s, studying architecture in the city of Halle but the magnetic pull of politics was irresistible, diverting her from her studies and leading her down a road of mystery. Sakin Kansi and Fidan Dogan were also deeply entrenched in the political landscape. Their existence was also entangled with the PKK. These three ladies, each with a rich history, found themselves in the core of the city of love, a place known for its romance and aesthetics, not for providing refuge to fugitives from far off lands, they had seemingly discovered a sanctuary, a place to carry on their work shielded from the scrutiny of their enemies. However, as we will soon unearth, no place is genuinely secure. On the ominous day of January 9, 2013, 
the existence of these three ladies was abruptly and violently terminated. Their voices, once resonating with conviction and defiance, were forever silenced. The city of love had morphed into the stage for a chilling political extermination, a stark reminder that even in the most picturesque of metropolises, darkness lurks in the shadows. Three women sinisterly snuffed from existence in a metropolis that never slumbers. Emerging from the shadows, Omer Guni, the chief suspect in this chilling triple murder. After the shocking Parisian assassination, the French authorities quickly narrowed their focus to Guni. A man wrapped in a shroud of mystery, he was as mysterious as the crime itself. Born and bred in Turkey, Guni boasted a past as intricate and perplexing as imaginable. He was a man of many identities, a construction worker, a security guard, a political advocate, continually shifting personas like a chameleon alters its hues. But it was his alleged connection with the National Intelligence Organization of Turkey that cast the darkest pall over his narrative. Guni was apprehended as the primary accused in the murder with good reason. The proof was damningly pointing towards him. There was the security footage that identified him at the scene of the crime, the ballistic report that connected the bullets found at the scene to his firearm, and then his erratic conduct after the assassination. But what possibly drove Guni to supposedly perpetrate such a horrendous act? Could it be political inducement, personal grudge, or perhaps something more malignant altogether? Theories multiplied, as cryptic as the man himself. Whispers arose of being a puppet in a broader geopolitical game, of him being made a scapegoat for a felony he did not commit. Amidst these allegations, one fact stood out. Guni was the prime suspect in a triple homicide that had sent shockwaves across the globe. However, as the noose grew tighter around Guni, destiny had a cruel card to play. Before the trial could even commence, Guni was diagnosed with a terminal brain malignancy. As time ran out on his life, so did the chances of ever truly unveiling the reality behind his supposed involvement in the assassination. An accused apprehended, but would justice prevail? This was the question looming in the air, as dense and ominous as the Parisian fog on that ill-starred January night. The French constabulary, a shining light of justice, embarks on a mission to uncover the truth. The inquiry into Leila Salemez's assassination was no simple task. It entailed a labyrinth of shadowy corridors, a journey into the abyss of political subterfuge and concealment. Right from the beginning, the French constabulary realized they were grappling with something far more significant than a spontaneous act of aggression. The characteristics of the crime, the identities of the casualties, their connections to a contentious group, all of these pointed towards a crime that was not only preconceived, but meticulously strategized and carried out. The forensic squad launched into action sifting through the crime scene for any fragment of proof that could lead them to the murderer. The apartment where the homicides occurred was a mute spectator, its walls reverberating the untold tales of that ominous day in January. As the evidence began to seep in, the investigators seemingly had an easy case to close. The alleged perpetrator had left a slew of evidence pointing towards his guilt. It should have been an open and closed case. However, in the pursuit of justice, Life has a knack for delivering unexpected cruelties. This was the scenario in the assassination of the three young women taken in their youth. The primary suspect, Omer Guni, who had been apprehended for the crime, never stood trial. Life, it seems, had a different agenda. Rather than facing the hammer of fairness, Guni met the cold hand of destiny. As his court date drew near, a malignant tumor claimed his existence in December of 2016 just a month before his scheduled court appearance. His premature demise sent shockwaves through the investigation. His death was a plot twist nobody could foresee. The key suspect, the man thought to hold the answers, was gone. The chance of a confession, of comprehending the motive behind the horrific act, had been extinguished. It felt as though the final piece of the mystery had been irretrievably lost. The news of Goonie's demise on the situation was seismic. The prosecution was left in chaos. Their main lead vanished, the truth of the tragic day in Paris seemingly interred with Guni. The shock was not only to the legal proceedings, but also to the likelihood of ever revealing the entire truth behind the assassination. In the grand game of life, this was a checkmate by destiny. The investigators were left with a table full of elements, but no adversary to fight against. A situation that had started with a bang was now fading towards an ambiguous ending. 
The demise of Omer Gooney before trial was not just an untimely end for a man but also a premature termination for a situation that had captivated the world. It was a heartless twist of fate that left more queries than solutions, an enigma that remained cloaked in the darkness of the unknown. An unresolved situation, a story left unfinished. In conclusion, it is the quietude that conveys much more than words. As the remnants of this grim chapter subsided, the consequences of this atrocity reverberated across distances. The kin of Leila Salemez, Sakin Kansiz, and Fidan Dogan were left wrestling with an immense emptiness, their sorrow intensified by the grim reality of justice not met. The PKK, this secretive assembly that had previously included these women, felt the sharp bite of their absence. Their zeal was undimmed, their determination only strengthened. For them, these assassinations were more than just an assault on three of their own, but a ruthless attack on their belief system. This heinous act also stirred up diplomatic chambers, exacerbating the already strained relations between Turkey and Germany. The fact that Salemez, a fugitive sought by Turkey, had found sanctuary in Germany, did not sit well with Ankara, igniting a series of responses that further embittered their relationship. Three lives hushed, a truth concealed, and a city forever marred. One woman, one metro carriage, and a murder that remains a mystery to this day. Welcome to the strange case of Letitia Toureau. In the heart of Paris, 1937, a murder mystery began to unfold within the confines of a metro carriage. The victim? The captivating dual existence of Letitia Toureau as a laborer and an undercover agent. Her days were spent blending in with the bustling city life at a factory, but as darkness fell, her secretive second life emerged. She was a secret agent, infiltrating the perilous world of a far-right terrorist group, La Cagoul. The enigma of Letitia's homicide with zero observers or tangible proof is as much a riddle as her double life. The lack of leads loosely incriminated La Cagoul. Yet the sudden termination of the investigation with the commencement of the Second World War left more questions than answers. An ordinary woman with an extraordinary secret life, Letitia Toureau was destined for a fate that still baffles the world. But how did Letitia find herself alone in a Paris metro carriage fatally stabbed on that dreadful day in 1937? Let's turn back the hands of time. The 6th of May, 1937, broke like any other day, with the city abuzz and Letitia Toureau leading her dual existence. As the day unfolded, the apparently ordinary events preceding the murder seemed routine, disguising the lethal culmination that was on the horizon. After completing her shift at the factory, she ventured to a dance hall, a venue where she was frequently seen. She departed the dance hall around nine in the evening, possibly to take the metro home. Her ensuing stop was the Porte de Charenton metro station. She stepped into the first class carriage, a section typically teeming with passengers, but unusually deserted that night. It was slightly past nine, an hour when the city was generally buzzing with nightlife, but the carriage was alarmingly silent with Letitia as its sole passenger. The train dove into the tunnel's obscurity and when it surfaced at the ensuing station, merely a minute later, the scenario within the carriage had altered dramatically. The previously vacant carriage now held a few more passengers who were met with a horrifying sight. Letitia, the solitary passenger from the prior station, was reclining in her seat with a knife embedded in her neck. In that fleeting moment, in that lonely carriage, Letitia Toureau had met her tragic fate. The eerie metamorphosis of the vacant carriage into a crime scene made the train journey's lonely beginning a stark contrast to its grim ending. In the blink of an eye, Letitia was no more, leaving behind a string of mysteries and a carriage full of bewildered passengers. Without any eyewitnesses and immediate suspects, the detectives were left puzzled. Now, envision as a detective in the late 1930s, you have a murder to solve, but without the assistance of CCTV surveillance, DNA testing, or the internet. It's solely your intellect battling the world. And in this scenario, the world was a maze of secrets and fabricated stories. Letitia Toureau, the secret agent, was a mystery herself. Her dual existence added intricacy to the investigation. It was a task of locating a needle in a haystack, with the haystack being a puzzle box itself. The absence of evidence, except for a murder weapon without fingerprints, presented a substantial obstacle. It seemed as if the murderer had ghosted, abandoning a lifeless body in a Paris metro carriage. The most daunting problem? The absence of observers. The train carriage was deserted except for Letitia. The murderer had chosen the perfect moment to strike, leaving the detectives with zero individuals to interview. 
and none to validate hypotheses. Despite these barriers, the investigators left no stone unturned. They delved into Letitia's convoluted life, hoping to uncover a cause hidden amidst her secrets. They traced the tracks that led them to the chilling far-right faction, La Cagoule. Yet, amidst the confessions and allegations within the group, the lack of solid evidence made it unfeasible to accuse anyone. The probe was a convoluted labyrinth with an evident root to the core. Each hint seemed to generate more queries than solutions. It was a chase against time, but the ticking clock had the upper hand. As the world tilted on the verge of World War II, the quest for justice for Laetitia took a back seat. The detectives were reassigned to other cases, and the trail became frosty. The endeavor to unearth Letitia's murderer was proving to be as elusive as the woman herself. So who could have wished for Letitia's demise? The answer might reside in her clandestine lifestyle. As we dig further into the murky depths of this unresolved enigma, we find ourselves ensnared in a labyrinth of spying and radical politics. Letitia Toureau, maintaining a dual existence as a laborer by daylight and a secret agent under the cloak of darkness, was penetrating the extreme right terror organization known as La Cagoule. This perilous dance of deceit could easily have marked her as a target within the very organization she was trying to unveil. The doubts were naturally directed toward members of La Cagoule, especially Jean Filiol. After all, they had the most at stake if Letitia's clandestine activities were disclosed. In this sinister maze of intrigue, the one name that consistently surfaced was that of Jean Filiol. Often earmarked as the main suspect, Filial was a man with a reputation as dark as the secrets he harbored. In a turn of events that could rival the storyline of a Hollywood suspense movie, several members of La Cagoule admitted to their participation in the murder. These admissions, while incriminating, were as cryptic as the woman they were claimed to have killed. They sketched a scene of treachery, a double agent unmasked, and a fatal aftermath. However, these admissions did not culminate in the one might anticipate. In an action as puzzling as the murder itself, no accusations were ever leveled against Jean Filial. Despite the admissions and the growing evidence, the case petered out, leaving us with more riddles than solutions. Yet, despite the accumulation of evidence, the main suspect was never indicted. And so, the murder case of Letitia Toureau was shelved, consumed by the eruption of World War II. Just like that, the harrowing homicide of a woman living an enigmatic dual existence got lost in the shuffle as world powers ascended the stage. The year was 1939, and the globe had larger issues to grapple with. Toureau's unresolved homicide, a case draped in layers of diverse conjectures encircling her death and the absence of definitive responses, was left swaying in limbo. The complexities of the case, as intriguing as they were puzzling, stimulated widespread guesswork. Who was Laetitia Toureau indeed? A basic laborer or a covert agent? Or perhaps something even more? Who harbored the intent to forever mute her voice? Was it the far-right extremist group, La Cagoule, she was allegedly infiltrating? Or was her demise the plot of a more intimate feud? The theories were extensive, the concrete facts, scarce. The open-ended nature of the case served as a rich substrate for fictional narratives. The French, known for their penchant for drama and suspense, could hardly resist but to capture Letitia's saga in a television series. A story too consuming to overlook. A woman navigating a life layered with peril and deceit. Meeting a shocking end in the most public of locales, a Paris metro carriage. The fascination extended beyond TV. A book, appropriately christened Murder in a Metro, was inked, fanning the flames of the public's persistent intrigue with the case, leading its depiction in television and literature. The book ventured into the specifics, scrutinizing the established facts and theorizing about the unknown. Yet despite all the suppositions and postulations, the reality stayed elusive. Letitia Toureau's homicide continues to be one of the most captivating unsolved enigmas of the 20th century. A story of fascination, suspense, and a crime that to the present day remains unresolved. And isn't that the allure of an unsolved mystery? It keeps you speculating, maintains your curiosity, and draws you back for more. In the annals of unresolved crimes, the murder of Dmitry Navachin stands as a haunting testament to the shadowy world of political intrigue. Born in the heart of Russia, Dmitry Navachin was a man of many talents, an economist and statesman who wielded his knowledge and influence during the economic distress of the 1930s. 
He was a central figure, a guiding force in the French Popular Front, a lighthouse amidst the stormy sea of fiscal chaos that swept across the nation. His role was as substantial as it was intricate, serving as the director of Bissan Eurobank in France, piloting the vessel through the murky waters of economic uncertainty. Despite his Russian origins, Navachin was not a man to be restrained by the confines of nationalism or doctrine. His socialist leanings did not anchor him to the rigid ideologies of Marxism-Leninism. No, Navachin was a man of wider vision, his philosophical compass pointing more towards the popular front than the Red Square. This in itself was a daring posture in the politically charged climate of the time, a stand that could earn both praise and hostility. But it was not just his financial acumen or political alignment that set Navachin apart. It was his uncanny skill to navigate the complex maze of political and economic dynamics, to balance on the thin line between the various political factions contending for power and control. His was a game of chess on a worldwide scale with stakes loftier than most could comprehend. Yet, as we know, every game has its risks, every player their weak points. And it was one such weak point that would eventually shroud Navachin's life in a cloak of mystery and intrigue. The morning of January 25, 1937, would mark a brutal end to Navachin's life, a crime that remains unresolved to this day. As we delve into this ongoing mystery, remember that the echoes of the past often hold mysteries that are as engrossing as they are evasive. The morning began like any other, but before it concluded, Navachin would be a name forever imprinted in the history of unresolved homicides. On the break of dawn on January 25, 1937, Dmitry Navachin, a distinguished Russian economist and politician, commenced his morning in Paris, unaware of the grim destiny that awaited him. A creature of habit, he was known to take his morning stroll around the vicinity, a routine that, on this particular morning, would bring him to a tragic end. As the city was just starting to wake, Navachin was discovered, lifeless, in an empty alleyway. His body bore the unmistakable indications of an assassination, a savage conclusion to a man who dedicated his existence to economics and politics. The news sent tremors through the city and the corridors of power, leaving a chilling question suspended in the frosty Parisian atmosphere. Who would want to murder Dmitry Navachin? The initial probe into his demise was quick and meticulous. The authorities sifted through every detail of Navachin's existence, his links, his political associations, even his intimate relations, in a desperate attempt to uncover any leads. But the deeper they dug into his life, the more they unearthed a perplexing array of discrepancies. Despite being a socialist, his ideologies portrayed a different loyalty, a fact that earned him both companions and adversaries in equal measure. The crime scene itself offered scant insight. No weapon was discovered and there were no indications of a struggle, suggesting that Navachin had been taken by surprise. The murderer had struck with brutal efficiency and vanished without leaving a trace, leaving behind a mystery that would confound investigators for decades to come. Despite the best attempts of the investigators, the path to Navachin's killer would soon hit a dead end. In the wake of Navachin's homicide, the world of politics and espionage would intersect in a storm of conjecture and doubt. As the dust settled on Dmitry Navachin's untimely demise, a dark web of intrigue started to unveil. Hypotheses sprouted like weeds, each one more twisted than the last. The echoes of Navachin's death reverberated through the silent corridors of power, leaving behind a trail of questions and a tangible sense of unease. At the core of the conjecture was the question of who might have wanted Navachin removed. The prime suspects, Soviet agents and fascist groups. Navachin, a Russian socialist, trod a delicate path between the ideologies of the Popular Front and Marxism-Leninism. His political leanings and clout were enough to mark him. Could his death have been the result of a power play, a move by those who eyed his clout as a threat? The likelihood was unnerving, but the plot did not end there. Navachin's murder was not a solitary occurrence. His death was a segment in a grim jigsaw puzzle of political homicides that had France in its clutches during the 30s. Each homicide, a strand in an elaborate web of deceit and treachery, adds to the enigma surrounding Navachin's death. Overshadowing these events were the invisible puppeteers who manipulated the strands of this lethal game. Were they political adversaries, undercover agents, or extremists? The truth, it appeared, was as elusive as the morning fog, 
And so as the years rolled on, the questions persisted. The echoes faded into silence. But the web of intrigue around Navachin's death resisted unwinding. The man, his existence, and his premature end became emblematic of the perilous dance between politics and power. With each passing year, the mystery surrounding Navachin's death only thickened. In the lack of solid proof, the murder of Dmitry Navachin has given birth to a plethora of postulations and guesswork. The initial suspects center around the Soviet connection. Considering Navachin's political inclinations, some surmise that Soviet agents could have orchestrated the murder. Navachin's ideological disconnect might have landed him in the bad books of the Russian hit list. Another theory implicates fascist factions. The 1930s were an era of political turbulence and the surge of fascism was engulfing Europe. Navachin, being a socialist and a notable individual, could have been perceived as a threat by either of these factions. Moreover, his murder connects with other politically driven killings in France during that period, indicating a potential pattern. Then, there are some who surmise that the murder was an outcome of internal politics within the French Popular Front, or even due to a personal grudge. After all, politics can be a treacherous field, and Navachin was at the heart of it. But in spite of these speculations, solid proof is scant. The investigations were hindered by the political environment at the time, with the impending menace of World War II and the emergence of covert political entities. These elements, together with the passage of time, have made it challenging to conclusively resolve the case. Perhaps the most exasperating aspect of this enigma is the tantalizing clues left behind. Every postulation seems credible yet incomplete, leaving us to guess and theorize. And so, the query remains. Who murdered Dmitry Navachin? Years have elapsed since Dmitry Navachin met his premature demise, yet the puzzle of his assassination continues to fascinate. The question of who murdered this Russian economist and politician still lingers, a tantalizing tale that defies unraveling. His death, veiled in a haze of deception, had extensive consequences. It triggered waves throughout the global political landscape, instigating murmurs of conspiracy and inflaming the strife of an already turbulent epoch. His assassination was not just another crime, it was a monumental event that rocked the globe and its reverberations can still be detected today. The enduring interest in Navachin's case is a testament to its perpetual allure. Crime enthusiasts meticulously examine the details, dissecting theories and conjecturing about the identities of the possible perpetrators. Every fresh lead, every unearthed piece of evidence only deepens the puzzle, fanning the embers of our fascination. Which of the three factions do you think did it? Let us know in the comments below.